WEAF New York. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Number 7, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. Where are they, uh, Red Guy? Warrington, Virginia, a small town with roughly a little over 9,900 inhabitants, and an hour west of Washington, D.C., a pleasant and quaint place in the countryside of Northern Virginia. But is it possible that a place seemingly insignificant and out of the way could have been critical in the fight for World War II? To learn more, we went to the Cold War Museum at Vint Hill, just a few miles from downtown Warrington. We're standing here today in a modern vineyard on what once was Vint Hill Farm. The farm was named after the Vint is wine. And so the owner of the farm back during the Revolutionary War era made an attempt to grow grapes here, unsuccessfully as it turned out. Uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson did the same thing down in Monticello. He also had a problem with it. But that's how the name got, uh, got assigned to this piece of land here, about 700 acres. And so the vent of Vent Hill is all about grapes. So years go by, it's a very productive area out here. It's heavy duty horses until we get to the Civil War. And what happens in the Civil War is that both armies are kind of coming and going through here. And when an army of 40 or 50,000 men march through your backyard, they can strip everything down to like locusts. So the farmer here was pretty successful in keeping the plantation intact and functioning. And that's how we got to the Bent Hill story. The whole story changes dramatically in December of 1941. About a week after Pearl Harbor, a single corps officer from the Pentagon is invited out for a Sunday lunch by the farmer who's living at what is now the Bent Hill Inn. And after lunch, they go in the back room and the farmer says, look at this, I can get the taxi dispatches from downtown Berlin, Germany on my shortwave radio here. The single corps officer's eyes pop out. They have fallen into the discovery of a unique geological formation that serves as a natural antenna and picks up radio signals like nowhere else in the world. There is one other place in California, Two Rock Ranch, where they found that sort of thing. But this was the beginning of that, of that kind of technology. So what will happen is, is that within a week, the Army sends a lawyer out and knocks on the front door and says, congratulations, here's a check for $127,000. We just bought your farm. You have 48 hours to vacate. Within six days, there were antennas on the roof of what is now the Bay Lynn and they're listening in on the Japanese Purple Code. The Purple Code is used by the Japanese Foreign Service, by their embassies, and so the smart guys at the Army Security Agency have figured out how to decrypt that, that uh, code. But in order to, to turn it into actionable intelligence, you need to be very organized. So that's what they would do here. This would become the depot where all kinds of, of uh, processes would be going on basically to track the Japanese ambassador in Berlin from Tokyo. One of the interesting things that happened here at that hill had to do with women in the army. 1941, there's no mechanism in U.S. law for women to be a soldier, period. Nurse Corps, okay, but not, they're, not, they're not soldiers. So what would happen is, Eve Rogers, a 17-term congresswoman, uh, decides that there were jobs that men were doing, that women could take over those jobs so that the men could go to fight in the combat units. So she would create the legislation, creating the Women's Army Corps, and also the GI Bill and the Veterans Administration. So this lady is a pretty powerful force. So what would happen here is, is that in the spring of 1942, uh, they're standing up monitoring Station 1 here. It's the beginning of all that intelligence gathering through telephone monitoring and airwaves and all that stuff. And so the smart guys down in Washington are inventing this stuff. 
But the folks who do the nuts and bolts work on it are the people out here who are monitoring frequencies 24-7, who are doing all the busy work you have to do to make a program like this successful. So what happens is, is that uh, in Iowa is the Women's Army Corps basic training, and they start filtering the graduates for people who have got musical backgrounds, or people who have mathematics backgrounds, to come down here and become ditty boppers, uh, which is the, the infection in yeah, which is what they uh, call Morse code intercept people. And so, yeah. in short order, what we would have is uh, 25 or 30 women arrived here who trained up as the Morse code intercept operators. And the men who would be filling those positions were indeed released to go off to the combat units. One of those was a guy named Dayton Burroughs. And uh, we have pictures of him here. And what would happen is he would go through all the school here, cryptology stuff and then the next thing you know he ends up in Burma with the OSS riding elephants around and so indeed a woman replaced him here and so uh, this is one of the earliest places in the United States law for women to be soldiers and many years would go by until clear into 2015 the army would finally allow the assignment of women to infantry units so it, it takes multiple generations Another of the things that happened here at Van Hill, which were significant, was the fact that there was a team of Japanese Americans here who did the translation of these secret code intercepts from Japanese to English. And so this is a picture of one group of them, and if you look at the picture, there's rank in here. These are very senior guys. So we think that they were from the Hawaii National Guard, and that they were a known commodity, and they made this contribution to the war effort that was probably more significant than any contribution made by any other group of Japanese Americans. So that was the real deal. In the darkest times, people can always lighten and So they had a ukulele band, and they would go all around here and make pictures in, in Warwick in front of the, the Faulkner County Post Office downtown there, and they're all holding their ukuleles and their, their lays so in the middle of the war, even though there was a lot of tension and bad things, there were some things that happened that were really fun. And that clearly qualifies as a little more fun thing to here. Thank you for watching, and please don't hesitate to stop by the Cold War Museum in Vint Hill, open on Saturday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. and Sunday.